Hello, uh, this is Art in the Digital World, and I'm your host, Brandon Town. And this is a show about uh, artists who have various skills and techniques. Um, and we have done some digital artists in the past, but today we're going to do something a little different. We have someone who does some more fine art, and um, where he's going to talk to us about what he has done and uh, his techniques and all kinds of fun art things. So this is our ho this is our guest, uh, Harion Rios, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of what you what you do. What kind of artist are you? <laughs> um, well, Brandon, I'm um, actually a performing artist. In um, at first, I started with a two dimensional, and um, as I went through the university, I, I uh, got acquainted with uh, the performing end of it as well. Um, it's really interesting because you get people involved within the pieces that you produce. Um, I believe that that takes it into a modern context as opposed to the frozen image that you, know, that you have with a painting. Um, and so that's where my direction is at this point. Great. So tell me about the schooling. You said you went to school. To, what school did you go to? And well, actually, um, my first exposure was through the Washington School of Art, Port Washington, New York. And that was when I was very young, about 13 years old. At that time, it was a school where you had people as Norman Rockwell was the teachers there who would um, correct your work, and um, they would send overlays. Unfortunately, at that time, I did not know who Norman Rockwell was, and I would throw the overlays and keep my work and correct my work. Little did I know that I was destroying some very valuable pieces. So that was my first exposure. Um, my second exposure to art was I went to study art at the Academia de San Carlos in Mexico City where we had such people as Diego Rivera, uh, Jose Alfaro Siqueiros, uh, two of the probably Mexico's greatest painters. And I was actually accepted into the studio of Diego Rivera, but in Ju I went there in June of 1957. And unfortunately, Diego died on the 27th of November of 1957. So I was there so shortly. I was admitted to the atelier of uh, Jose Alfaro Siqueiros. However, his temperament was one that, uh, a little egocentric. Uh, when I started to ask of the program, he said, well, I realize that I'm not going to allow you into my studio because my students steal my ideas. So everything will be out in the projects. At that time, I said to myself, well, I don't know if I'd like that. And so I opted to return to the States. Um, immediately, I opened my art studio in Mission San Jose, 19, well, that same year, 57. So I operated that from 57 to 1961. I was very successful. I was actually helped unite the city of Fremont by designing their city seal. And of course, the publicity that I got was so fantastic that I could never have paid for the, had I paid personally. So I was very busy. Uh, consequently, I wanted to go to school, so I started to go to college in San Jose City College, and um, I did take art there, but mostly the other academics. And unfortunately, I dropped my load and was then conscripted into, with Uncle Sam into the U.S. Army, and of course, I went to Vietnam. Upon returning, um, I went to, I started going through finishing my actual AA degree at uh, Laney College. I finished that and then transferred to the University of California. And there I took art. That was my emphasis. But of course, you had to fulfill other academics. And um, from there, I was actually, I had the opportunity to, to meet uh, Mr. Earl Loran, uh, the first man that wrote about Cezanne. He wrote the first book on Cezanne and was given the MFA for that. He somehow alluded to the fact that my drawings were very close to Cezanne's. So he said, you know, if you want to go to grad school, 
I will be more than happy to recommend you. So he recommended it to Stanford, where um, Nathan Oliveira was there, a very fine painter, and then also to Mills. And at Mills, I, um, I opted Mills because I was close by, and um, I finished there. I skipped the Masters and went directly into the MFA. And I have exposure there both in photography, uh, sculpture, ceramics, painting. And uh, so as a, with an MFA, you have to be prolific in those various fields so you can teach them. And um, after that, of course, uh, with a degree, I got a commission of General John C. Fremont to actually um, do a commission here. But John C. Fremont, of course, naturally lived here in Mariposa. And uh, he actually had the Oso mine, the Mariposa mine, and lived in the town of Mount Bullion, which was actually named after his father-in-law, who was a senator then. And um, that's what brought me here. I did the research here. I started the project. But then, as you remember, Proposition 13 came along, and the city dropped the funds. And of course, I was already here. I had dropped. I have started a studio, and uh, I remain here. And it was very good. Of course, I didn't have the liaison of uh, the large universities or the, ex you know, obviously there aren't any here. And so I opted to say, well, I'll stay here. And in the interim, um, nice things began to happen. Somehow, I was always into the art. I was asked to design um, the first monument for the Vietnam uh, veterans of Tuolumne County, which now it is in um, actual, in front of the library of, of Sonora. Um, I should say that I wasn't that the original designer. It was an actually architect. But when they asked him to do it, he had never built anything. And of course, they asked me to Let's complete the project. So that's how I got involved with that. And then, of course, I started teaching at uh, Columbia College. Very successfully, the classes grew. I started a program called Community Education for the Retired People. And um, it grew, it grew, and it has grown. Um, and then this just two years ago, I was asked to do another monument, which is the um, veterans clinic in the junction and it's best seen in the evening because the lighting is extremely well uh, done and that is uh, a monument that commemorates all the departments of defense and it's going to be a living monument because it will have actual photos of people that have actually perished in the theaters um, this of course now has catapulted me into an exhibition that I will be having in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And it will be sometime within the next year and a half, two years. And it deals with my, th my thesis. I actually was, um, when I did my thesis, I actually predicted the homeless and the, also the, uh, you know, how to resolve the homeless. We got such people involved as Mr. Bob Hope, the mayor of Berkeley, and uh, those were the two main people. However, I um, came to the mother load, and of course, I did not continue with that. I let it go and continued to do the collection. And now, um, we're going to actually follow up with that. So I'm very excited in that respect. Well, it sounds like you've had quite a prolific uh, artist's life with a lot of experience. You know. Uh, a lot of the people who come on the show, they kind of have similar stories of doing various different things. You know, never it's never just one thing. They do photography and painting and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, you have some pieces that you brought with you, and uh, I'd love to to for you to talk about them and for you to kind of show them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Show kind of maybe what your style is and talk about them. Oh. So what do you have here, this, this piece here? If you want to pick it up and hold it up. Um, actually, this is, uh, you know, when I started in Fremont, um, I was, of course, you know, exposed to ecclesiastical art. And naturally, um, there was the Order of Nuns called the Holy Family Sisters of San Francisco. I had no idea of their history, and it's so rich. 
that I learned so much of the history of San Francisco and the mother load. Um, a book has been actually, it's based on the book, it's called The Holy Family Sisters of San Francisco, um, 1872 to 1922. And um, we deal here with the foundress of the order, um, McCall Mother Dolores Armour Tobin. Um, the Tobins extracted about $10 million in gold from the mother load. And thusly, they established the first Hibernia Savings and Loan Association, which now has been bought by an actual bank. I believe it's a Hong Kong bank. I don't know what the name of it is. But um, the um, young woman here uh, was not going to be a nun. The actual uh, history behind it is that in the wealthy homes, she started bringing a lot of the waifs, children that had no whatsoever no homes and then of course the bishop at the time noticed that and said you know have you ever thought of becoming a nun she said no and eventually she actually came to him and said yes she says i think i would but i want to start my own order so she did she went to the dominican order and said well at least i have a pattern uh, to pattern my my own order and it has become very successful during the earthquake in San Francisco the, and the cholera epidemic. They actually served the city so well that um, they worked without any pay whatsoever. And so the order became very well known. The city made a decree that actually those nuns would never pay anything if they were in public transportation. And as long as they showed their badges that they were actual um, religious, um, they don't pay any transportation, even today. Um, it, it is actually, the, the painting is based on the book. Um, she holds the actual vows of commitment, humility, service. And this is her co-founder. Um, uh, when I did this painting, it has a lot of symbolism. As you know here, you'll see an abstraction of, of the San Francisco cable car. Um, you'll see here at, at this area that there is a, a, a picture of, a, of an actual a Roman soldier to represent that these women are soldiers of their own will, serving humanity. Actually, she has a very interesting life because she actually establishes the very first daycare homes for people that actually, uh, or mothers that don't have husbands. So they would take care of the children free of charge and uh, a very benevolent order. Um, the, the background represents the order that within, and then this area here, actually, we wanted to bring other religions into the picture, like, you know, the um, Muslim religions where they don't represent, um, quote, God in the image of man. And so it's all done in geometric shapes. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. This you have a really wonderful pattern around here mm -hmm. that is a I don't know. I really like it. It's a it's different. It's it's very cool. Oh, very good. Yes, and and there's symbolism to the whole thing. Like I said, this little rat here represents temptation. Um, they can leave the order anytime they want, so it isn't like they have to be in you know in cloistered. And um, when I first I did that when the order saw it they said oh my goodness what is that rat doing there but of course I had to allude to the fact of what the actual book said you know she was actually seeing a lady that was dying of syphilis um, it was a full moon this rat came into the sill and cast the shadow over and says oh my goodness this is a big animal when she realized it was a rat she says oh my goodness I shouldn't be worried about it so I put that there and that's then it has some sort of, you know, connection with trying to tell the lady here, you came from a wealthy family, why should you be in an environment of poverty, humility, and what have you? So that's what this little animal is here. And then this area here is a, an actual curtain that the curtain can be closed so that they can actually be encloistered or they can open it. And in the back, you see here, uh, an exit door in stairs, and that is where 
they can leave the order and marry. So they're really not subject to being in the order. Mm -hmm. Today, the order has grown all the way into Hawaii, the United States, and uh, these prints have been made and distributed through the various orders. Um, I haven't said the dimensions of it. It's about seven feet high by five feet this way. So it's a very large painting. I was going to say, I don't think this doesn't look like the original. <laughs> no, no. This, yeah. It's a, um, you know, a reproduction, of course. Yeah. At that time when it wasn't like today, you had to do a color separation. Very expensive at the time. And um, so it has a tremendous, um, you know, amount of work and cost. The frame came from Yugoslavia. The, the canvas also came from Europe. They wanted nothing but the best. And so it was really quite, quite a project. That's and wonderful. So you, and you have another painting over here. Yes. I'm, um, I'd love to look at that and we'll see yes. that one. Uh, this one here actually is uh, a painting of a, an artist that was actually very, very famous. This is, his name is Robert Rochelle. But he died uh, at the age of 67 of cancer. And actually, he did the portrait of President Reagan then when he was Governor Reagan. And it's in the rotunda in Sacramento. And I would go to his uh, classes and actually see he was a fantastic uh, artist, a very a masterful artist. And I started doing a book on him. And so his photographer actually gave me this. This is also of another artist. Uh, I can't remember his name at this point, but um, the photographer got, this is what he got paid for, 10 years' work of photographing Mr. Rochelle's work. <laughs> so the painting is probably worth in the neighborhood of thirty-five dollars to $40,000. His painting, Mr. Rochelle's paintings, are going at about one hundred seventy-five. And I'll show you, this, is, this was just an exercise he did of his uh, fellow artist. And uh, I'd like to show you, if I may, yeah. um, you know, the... His, his teacher, who actually was a Jimmy Swinnerton, and I don't think too many people know Jimmy because he was actually the a cartoonist of Mr. Randolph Hearst. And as you know, of course, he had the publication of The Examiner, the um, various publications. And so Mr. Um, Swinnerton uh, was the actual artist that, that did all of that. And I'd like to show a, a portrait that was done by, by his student, which is Mr. Robert Rochelle here. And I don't know if you can see this, um, but this is Mr. Jimmy Swinnerton, a, a portrait of, of, Robert, uh, of, of Mr. Swinnerton by Robert Rochelle. Um, Mr. Swinnerton and Robert Rochelle actually were tied in with not only just the, um, the portraits of, of Governor Reagan, but he also did quite a number of portraits, like for the Hewlett Packards. Very important people now in Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, in doing my research, I have, I have the slides, and I have letters of Governor Reagan expressing how, how uh, happy he was. In fact, when Governor Reagan was here, um, they would be invited to the actual capital to have dinner. And so Mr. Rochelle and his wife would actually go there. Um, Mr. Swinnerton, as I said before, was tied in not only with Mr. Randolph Hearst, but also with Mr. Um, Walt Disney. So really, there's quite a, a tie between all of them. And of course, it's part of the artistic history that we have. Unfortunately, Mr. Robert Rochelle did not do a retrospective because he was too engage, engaged and involved in producing and of course, he got quite a bit of money for any of the portraits. And so he never really addressed that. And as a result of that, not having the retrospective, um, his name has gone into a little bit into oblivion. And only people that collected his work know of his work. But if you'd like to see one of his pieces, it's in the rotunda, or in, in the state capitol in Sacramento, where you have the various uh, governors. So that's, that's of of um, Mr. Swinnerton. Let's see if we can actually see. It's interesting to see, too, I was mm -hmm. mentioning before that 
comic, you said that was a comic artist. Yes. And how you yes. see things like comics in the paper and they seem so simple, but, um, but then you see their fine art and it's just really amazing what they can do. They really are wonderful artists and have a wide spectrum. They, can't, they don't just draw little stick figures, you know, they actually, they actually do know how to paint really wonderful things. They do, they do, they do, and this is one of the, one of the scripts that he did, and it's called Jimmy, little Jimmy after him, and very much so. The black and white, uh, obviously at the time, they didn't have the color, and it was all black and white until then color came into the picture, but by that time Mr. Swinnerton had passed away. Um, an interesting note about Mr. Swinnerton is that one day um, he actually asked Mr. Randolph Hearst, as you know, I don't know if you've been to the uh, Hearst Castle. I haven't. You haven't? Well, <laughs> I know where it is. You know where it is. <laughs> it would be nice to, if someday you would like to visit. It's, yeah. it's, he would have, Mr. Randolph Hearst would arrange people in order of how much he liked them. And we had this huge table whereby the closest people to him were the ones that he felt he really appreciated. And the farther away that you were from the table, the least you were into his, in his company. So Swinney, uh, or Mr. Jimmy Swinnerton was, uh, one day sat down and says, you know, it's time for me to get a raise. So he, he went over to Mr. Randall first and says, say boss, <laughs> I really would like to get a raise. And of course Mr. Randall first said, Jimmy, no. Of course Jimmy was just surprised. He said, look at I do all this work. And then Mr. Hurst, took him aside privately and says, Jimmy, why did you ask me to get, give you a raise? You know what you were asking? He says, no boss, no, no, I don't know. He said, if I had given you a raise right there, you know that I had to give a raise to everyone in the table. <laughs> and I don't think some of those people deserve a, a, a raise. So he says, oh boss, I'm so sorry. He says, well, that's my answer. And so it was, Mr. Randall first really had quite a, um, um, a way of, of dealing with his people. Um, if you visit the castle, it's full of most wonderful art, the highest skill of artisans, um, masons, you know, people within the um, other art fields, you know. So uh, I was hoping I would find here, oh, here we go. Here's another of Mr. Swinnerton's. Uh, Quite a colorful gentleman. Yeah. Very interesting man. So if anyone is interested in uh, Jimmy Swinnerton, it's I think it's a good way of learning about California artists. Hmm. And um, it is uh, public. It is put out by Harold G. Davidson. It's a small book, but really informative. And um, I think um, you know, giving us a good exposure as to the you know California artists that have now gone into the past and um, mm -hmm. just very interesting. Well, tell me what you think about how art has evolved since you sort of started doing it. Maybe that's a big question, but since you started doing it and, and you know, what it's turned into, especially today with things like computers and technology, you know, and kind of what your take is on how our art has evolved. Well, gee, um, it has evolved immensely, immensely. You know, um, I think today the fields whereby you really um, actually, you know, can make a living is mostly in digital art. And I think we can see that like Mr. Lucas, you know, the way he has used artists to make all those wonderful, you know, films like, you know, Star Wars. And of course, then we have others now today that, you know, I think everybody's familiar. I think that's the major art form now. And I think that they're integrating themselves. You really have to know how to draw well, but you also have to be able to use the computer well. So you can complement both of those, you know, fields. So um, I think it's wonderful. It's just that, for instance, uh, we still, I think, have the uh, old formal way of reproducing art, but we should combine them. And I know I have combined them in my works, um, particularly the, my sculptures. I'm dealing there with um, lasers, like the sculpture there in, in um, Sonora, the latest one, 
it was all laser cut. And you can cut so perfect, there's no such a way that any man can cut it with a torch. It's paper thin and just absolutely wonderful work. Um, well, we don't have that much time left, but tell us just a little bit about this. You, you're working on uh, an e-file or an e-book. Uh, an e-book, e -book. E yeah, e -book, yes. E -book. Um, actually, the, the Mocha Museum um, is actually in, affiliated with, with a gallery there that um, is actually compiling an ebook of various artists that, upcoming artists that, for instance, obviously have been working, but uh, they want to expose, I think, universally, because you know now through the internet, my goodness, you can read books, like an ebook, and actually be exposed to millions of people. So it is the way of selling art today. And that's where I think, as your first question that you asked me, I think that's a new way of marketing. Very effective, because I think museums are, or should I say galleries, are becoming dinosaurs, because you know, they wait for the public to come in, whereby on your a digital world, you know, you actually, in your computer, through your computer, you bring the art world into your home. Great. Right. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I, I'm young, and, <laughs> and I've been around computers all this time, but I like what you said about how there's, there's a way of integrating them. Um, you know, you watch all these new modern movies, but they do still have to draw and know how to do all that stuff. Well, um, we don't have that much time, just a couple more minutes, but uh, maybe you could just tell me real briefly, you know, what, do you, what kind of advice would you give to a young artist, you know, or, or what do you think would be good for them to, to learn or do? Or do? <laughs> um, well, number one is they should know, for instance, the basics of, of drawing, composition, impact. Um, that's something that's used today, even in your cameras. As you bring in the, the protagonist, you have to know where to put him, where he's most effective. Those principles are, are actually learned with, through drawing. And they're actually basic principles that are very important. So I would say start with the drawing, good basic drawing techniques, painting, and then go ahead and implement, implement those facts into your, uh, you know, your actual uh, imaging. Like for instance, when you select someone to be on the screen, where is it that's most effective for him to deliver or her to deliver um, what you feel the protagonist should deliver? And I think we see that today very well. It's, it's, it's been em employed extremely well, and I see that. I ask my students to actually watch, you know, movies and what have you to get that. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, some people think that it's dying out because of the digital age, but I don't think it is. It's never going to die out. No. I don't think so. Well, but... thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for watching Art in the Digital World. Have a great day.